bicarbonate or bicarbonic acid, but bicarbonate. There we go, bicarbonate. Uh, the point is uh, sodium bicarbonate or bicarbonate is a base and it absorbs H plus. And that's why a base can absorb H plus. Any question about that? By the way, this right here is one of the important buffers in your body. It is in blood. And if this, this can go both ways, by the way. And if you uh, get your blood too basic, the uh, bicarbonate right here, come on, mouse, will move this way. And then that will release hydrogen ions in your blood as well as uh, bicarbonate or whatever. <laughs> and uh, that will release acid in the blood to help neutralize the blood. On the other hand, if your, uh, if your uh, blood is too acidic, the uh, bicarbonate can combine with hydrogen ions in your blood to make bicarbonate. And I'm trying to remember what that's called. I'm just going to say sodium. Well, it's called sodium bicarbonate. I don't remember what the difference is between these two. There's a difference in their name. But this will happen in your blood to make this. And that will pull out hydrogen ions in the blood making the blood less acidic. And the point is, this: these two molecules are buffers in your blood to help uh, neutralize your blood. Any question about any of that? All right, uh, let's talk about salts and electrolytes. Let me end this. A salt is a substance that disassociates into cations meaning a positively charged ion, and an anion, meaning a negatively, negatively charged ion, neither of which are H plus or OH minus. For example, sodium chloride, table salt, can disassociate into sodium ions and chloride ions, and this is a salt. However, magnesium chloride, which will disassociate into magnesium plus two, and two chloride ions is also a salt. Any questions about that? Electrolytes are substances that disassociate into ions in solution, and then the electrolytes can conduct electricity. For example, salt water is better at conducting electricity than <clears throat> Fresh water. Any question about any of that? All right. Organisms need to maintain a fairly constant balance between their cellular acids and their bases to remain healthy. And as I stated, we have this molecule and that molecule in our blood. And if our blood becomes too acidic, the reaction is driven this way. This will combine with hydrogen to remove the hydrogen ions from the blood to help neutralize the blood. And how that happens is something like when you're eating something is that is acidic, like pickled foods or vinegar or even uh, a soda pop. The reason why you don't die when you drink soda pop is because you have this molecule in your blood, which can neutralize the acid of drinking the soda. And then vice versa, when you eat, I don't know, certain vegetables are basic and the blood becomes basic, this molecule in the blood can break down into HCO3 with a negative charge and H plus with positive charge to increase the acidity of the blood. Any question about any of that? All right. The pH is a measure of the hydrogen ions in solution. The pH exactly is 
equal to the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Uh, a log is just the scale, and then the hydrogen ion concentration is the pH. The pH scale runs between 0 and 14 on a log scale, pH 7 being where, uh, well, let me go through that exactly. pH equal to, you can get that right. Oh, I hit the wrong button. pH equals 7.0. We're just going to go there. This equals, let me blow that up a little. This is equal to uh, 1 times 10 to the 7 H plus, oops, ions, I don't have that right either. So this is one H plus ion. Let's see if I can do that. Not here. One H plus ion in one times 10 to the seventh water molecules. That's what pH seven means. pH eight. is one H plus ion in one times 10 to the eighth water molecules and pH nine the same. That makes sense. And then for uh, the acids, pH 6 is the same. Is one H ion in solution for 1 times 10 to the 6 water molecules. So that would be uh, a million water molecules. There's one H plus ion in solution if the pH is equal to 6. Any question about any of that? We come up here. Oh, we have uh, half an hour still. Okay, good. Um, So acid is where the hydrogen ion in solution is greater than the OH minus basic or alkaline solution where the OH minus in solution is greater than the H plus. Most organisms grow best around pH 7. So most grow best between something like uh, pH 6 to pH 8. Any question about any of that? All right, if not, let's talk about organic chemical compounds. You're seeing organic chemical compounds here. Uh, some of them can be fairly complex, like this one here and these here. You do have a few organic compounds which are simple. This is the simplest one. 
acetic acid, which is, I believe, vinegar. And I guess the simplest, that's not the simplest. Uh, this is the simplest, methane right there. Organic compounds always contain carbon and hydrogen. Oftentimes they contain oxygen, but they don't have to contain oxygen. And they may contain other molecules as well. Let me see if I can blow this up. So if they contain oxygen, I bring this down here. There may not be much oxygen in the molecule, like this one here. Well, that's not bad, two out of two. But this one here, most of these molecules are carbon and hydrogen, carbon and hydrogen. Uh, and there is some oxygen, but there's only two right there and two right there. And this we'll talk about later because let's just remove that. This is a phospholipid and and uh, we don't want to talk about a phospholipid right now. So we're only going to talk about this part of the molecule. Yep. Organic compounds always contain carbon and hydrogen. Many of them contain oxygen, but not all organic compounds do contain oxygen. They may contain other elements like nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus. All of these different atoms are held together covalently by an organic compound. Compared to inorganic molecules, they are more complex and they're capable of more complicated biological functions. Some examples of organic compounds include carbohydrates, nucleotides, lipids, and then various hydrocarbons. What a hydrocarbon is, is an organic compound that is only composed of hydrogen and carbon, like methane, ethane, and propane are all hydrocarbons. Any question about any of that? Uh, what's unique about organic compounds is that they tend to be held together by carbon. Carbon can hold or bind to four other atoms. Uh, carbon can be bonded together in a chain or a ring structure. So here we're looking at a linear structure. Let's go back here. And this would be the chain or the ring structure. And that's the linear structure. Uh, what's holding these atoms together are chemical covalent bonds. The carbon skeleton is the backbone of an organic compound. Uh, so right here, the carbon skeleton are the three carbon atoms being held together. And let's look at this one here. What's holding this molecule together, not this part here, but this molecule together, is almost entirely carbon backbone. The only exception is there and there. So the carbon skeleton tends to be the backbone of an organic chemical molecule holding the molecule together. We can have functional groups bound to a carbon backbone. These chemical functional groups influence the chemical behavior of organic compounds. And right here, we're seeing methanol on methane, the functional group, the OH group, gives this molecule different chemical properties than this molecule, methane. For example, methane is a hydrocarbon. It's a gas. It can uh, 
it doesn't dissolve well in water, meaning it's a polar molecule. No, excuse me, it's a nonpolar molecule. Uh, methanol, on the other hand, is a liquid, and so it dissolves well in water because of this OH group. And obviously, it's not a gas. And the point is, the only difference between methane and methanol is this functional group. Any question about any of that? All right. The functional groups are responsible for most of the chemical and physical properties of a particular organic compound. Hydroxyl groups, uh, the OH group, is a group found in alcohols. It is hydrophilic. Why methanol dissolves in water? Because the OH is hydrophilic. The methane is hydrophobic. Where do I have methane? Right here. Methane is hydrophobic. And that OH group helps the molecule dissolve in water or in alcohol. I think that should be in water, but we'll take a look there. It does dissolve in both because uh, methanol is an alcohol, so obviously it can dissolve in alcohol. Uh, here are the different functional groups you need to know about. The one surrounded by a red box. You need to know OH group, which is found in lipids and carbohydrates. And uh, it's not stated here, but it's found in uh, uh, nucleotides as well, or nucleic acids as well. Uh, you need to know the amino group, the NH2 group. It's found in proteins and amino acids. You need to know the carboxyl group. It's found in organic acid, in lipids, and then proteins and amino acids. And a carboxyl group is COO, with that O being a double carbon bond, and then this O being a single carbon bond, and this O has an H on it, so this is an OH group. And then the last group you need to know about, or functional group you need to know about, is the phosphate. And it's a PO4 with a negative charge. Phosphate is found in DNA, RNA, and ATP. Any question about any of that? Frequently, more than one functional group can be found in a single molecule. For example, all amino acids are shown below have both an amino group and a carboxyl group on the amino acid. Any question about any of that? Okay, when we're talking about uh, organic compounds, it's important to realize that we have macromolecules, which are big organic compounds that can be made up of smaller uh, molecules. And you can simply combine the small organic molecules to make the macromolecules. The macromolecules in biology are called polymers, consisting of many small repeating molecules that we call monomers. So many, well, actually all of the polymers are made up of monomers. An example of that is starch is a polymer and all it is is repeating monomers, which are glucose. Any question about any of that? All right, organic compounds can be created by dehydration synthesis. And another uh, word for dehydration synthesis is condensation reaction. 
where you can combine two monomers, R, O, H, the R just stands for anything, and then H, R are the two monomers, and the H comes off of this monomer, O, H comes off of that monomer, and in condensation reaction or dehydration synthesis, this R will now bind directly to that R, and then water comes off as the H and the OH come together to form water. Why it's called dehydration synthesis, in the synthesis of the RR polymer, we also um, make water. I think that's why it's called condensation reaction too, and that is uh, water condenses out of this reaction. The reverse molecule where you take the polymer and you add in water, you split the water, and then the hydrogen comes to this R, the OH of water comes to this R, and this is called hydrolysis, where you split the polymer by water. And usually when you split a polymer, you break off one monomer and so this would continue being the uh, smaller polymer. And I think I've got a better picture in the next one. Yeah, right here. Add the water that splits off this monomer, and then you have a smaller polymer right here. Let me state that you are familiar with hydrolysis, assuming you've seen the movie Back to the Future, and when Marty Mark McFly says to his ma, Ma, you sure know how to hydrate a pizza. She took this hockey puck-like structure and put it in his, her pizza hydrolysis machine and turned it on, and lo and behold, the pizza hyd hydrolyzed, and this beautiful pizza came out. And that was by the hydrolysis of the pizza. Any question about any of that? All right, so once again, dehydration synthesis, you get a monomer coming together, in this case, with a polymer, a smaller polymer. The hydrogen comes off the polymer. The OH comes off the monomer. Water will form from the hydrogen and the OH coming together. And then that monomer will directly link to the polymer. The reverse reaction I've already talked about, you add the watermer, you split the monomer off from the smaller polymer. Uh, the point is, is that dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis are the reverse of each other. All right, any questions about dehydration synthesis or hydrolysis. If not, let's talk about the four biological molecules. First, we're gonna talk about carbohydrates. These include sugars, starch, and other complex carbohydrates. They are important energy sources for people and living organisms. You can find carbohydrates in the structure you can find carbohydrates in nucleic acids. Carbohydrates always consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but not just in any general formula. They only are found in this specific formula, where for each carbon, there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. So for a carbohydrate, you can simply go CH2, Put it in parentheses and then put an N and you will have whatever the N is for that many groups in the carbohydrate. For example, with glucose, it's CH2O in parentheses and then the N is 6. So the glucose is C6H12 or H2 times 6, 12 and then O6. Any question about that? All right, 
simple sugars or strings of simple sugar are linked together to make the uh, other carbohydrates. And we can classify carbohydrates into three major groups based on their size. You have the monosaccharides. They are the monomers of carbohydrates. You have the disaccharides. Oh, mono means one, by the way, one saccharide. Saccharide means sugar. Disaccharide is two sugars. Di means two saccharide sugars. Uh, an example of a monosaccharide is glucose and fructose. An example of a disaccharide is uh, lactose. I used to know this. And maltose. I used to know this, all the disaccharides. I'm having a hard time remembering another disaccharide, lactose. I'm drawing a blank for what maltose is, glucose and glucose. Lactose is beta-galactose and glucose. I don't remember the other disaccharides. Okay. Isn't sucro sorry, isn't sucrose a disaccharide? Yeah, there it is. That's the one I was trying to think of. What's the name of sucrose? Table sugar. And that's fructose and glucose hooked together. All right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> polysaccharides are the complex car carbohydrates. The simplest polysaccharide is starch. And it's simply uh, glucose linked together one after the other in a simple chain. And the glucose is simply the monomer. And uh, starch is the polysaccharide or the polymer. All of the complex polysaccharides are the polysaccharides. Uh, let's take a little look at some monosaccharides and disaccharides. Monosaccharides are simple sugars. All of them are between three and seven carbon atoms, but usually monosaccharides are either five or six carbon molecules. All the monosaccharides are sweet. They're all water soluble. Here we go. Disaccharides are uh, formed by joining two monosaccharides together in dehydration synthesis. So you can take glucose, C6H12O6, and you shouldn't know that, by the way. Fructose is also C6H12O6, but fructose is in a different structure than glucose is shown here. And then you pull out the OH group from glucose, the H from fructose, and then link directly that oxygen to that carbon right here. Oxygen bound to this carbon in uh, dehydration synthesis to make sucrose. And then water is formed. And then to, to do the reverse, you take sucrose and you add water. Water will break apart, part of it going to the fructose, and that'll be the H to the fructose, and the OH minus to the glucose to um, have hydrolysis. Any question about any of that? All right. I already mentioned polysaccharides consist of many monosaccharides, many monomers. They can be straight or branch branch changed chained molecules. Uh, starch is mostly, not entirely, but mostly uh, simply glucose hooked together one after other another in a linear simple chain although this can be a very long chain, but uh, that's what starch is. Uh, starch can be branched, but it's not, doesn't branch very often. And mostly it's uh, non-branch like this. Here are some examples of some starchy foods. Starch, bread, 
cereals, pasta, rice, potato. Everybody knows these are starchy food. A lot of people don't know that beans and chestnuts are starchy foods too. And beans do have protein. They even have lipids, uh, but they are about a third uh, starch. And beans are actually about a third carbohydrate, a third protein, and a third uh, lipid or fat. Uh, chestnuts are similar, although I don't know the, the makeup of chestnuts. I think I show glycogen here. So starch right there. All it is is glucose up together, one after the other. So each of those dots is then glucose. A uh, glycogen is very similar. It's hooked together by uh, glucose, one after the other. Uh, glycogen is uh, the way our muscle cells and uh, heart, and what else? Liver store glucose. Uh, it's very similar to starch, except that this chain is branched. So right here, it's linear, and then it branches into two, and then that branches again into two more. Cellulose, we'll talk about it in a little bit. Let's see if I can blow this up. You have to blow it up real high to see. Cellulose, there, you can see it now. Uh, cellulose, once again, it is uh, simply glucose hooked together one after the other. It is a different length than in starch. But what makes cellulose so different is here is one strand of cellulose, and there is another strand and a third strand. And cellulose has a lot of hydrogen bonding between the cellulose. So this uh, glucose will have hydrogen bond to this glucose over here and to that glucose over there. This glucose here and that glucose there, that's a covalent bond. So wherever you have a blue bond, that is a chemical covalent bond. The dashed yellow and brown is a uh, hydrogen bond. I can mention that cellulose is something that most animals cannot digest. It is used in plants uh, to uh, help give them structure. And I assume plants have a lot of cellulose because they know that animals can't digest it. And for example, humans would never eat grass because we can't digest it. Cows can, but they don't digest the cellulose. What they do is they have a microbe and actually that microbe has bacteria and archaea in its gut uh, to digest the cellulose. So in reality, you've got the cow who has a microbe, and I used to know the name of that. Um, it's not an insect. What the heck is that called? Anyways, it has a microbe in it that has bacteria in it, and the bacteria can digest the cellulose. And that's how the cow can eat grass and digest it. Not because of what the cow can digest, but because of what its microbes microbe can digest. Chitin, I'm not going to talk about. We'll talk about peptidoglycan a little bit later in the term. For now, you just need to know that peptidoglycan does have... Uh, um, well, it is a partly carbohydrate and that it is linked together by monomers of sugar. We're not going to talk about what type of sugar now. We will later, but it is linked by simple sugars, one after the other. And it's linked by a few other things which are not a carbohydrate, and we'll talk about that later too. But uh, uh, peptidoglycan is considered at least a part of a carbohydrate if not entirely carbohydrate. Any questions about any of that? All right. 
lipids are uh, our next biological molecule we want to talk about. They consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And although lipids do have oxygen in it, there is not much oxygen in a lipid. Let me blow this up. I think you can see it there. So this is a, a fat, and not a fat, a, uh, a lipid, and uh, it has uh, a very long hydrocarbon chain right here. And it does have oxygen right there. And then this will come off, but it does have OH right there. So the point is there isn't much oxygen on this fatty acid, which is a component of a lipid. When we're talking about uh, fatty acids, it's important to realize that we can have a saturated fatty acid, which is shown here. A saturated fatty acid has all of the carbons linked together by a single carbon covalent bond, meaning all of these carbons here are linked to each other by a single carbon covalent bond. An unsaturated fatty acid has at least one double carbon bond linking the carbons together. And I'll show that here. Let me blow this up a little. There you go. So this hydrocarbon only has a single carbon a covalent bond linking the carbons together. Same with this one. But this one here has one double carbon bond where there are two covalent bonds linking the carbons together. Wherever there's a uh, double carbon bond, you'll get a kink in the structure of the molecule, in this case, a fatty acid. Any question about any of that? Let me go back to make sure I talked about everything. Yep, I did. All right. All right. So let's talk about simple lipids. They're also called fats or triglycerides. Triglycerides are the most common fat in the human body. And if you want to look at some triglycerides, just look at your belly. There's usually lots of triglycerides there, even if you're thin like me, because we store um, a layer of lipid underneath our skin in our belly. At least humans do. Fats contain a fatty acid, which is shown here. I guess I never said that. That's a fatty acid. And uh, one glycerol. So here is glycerol. Uh, it's this molecule here, the brown part here. And there's the fatty acid. The fatty acids can come together with glycerol to make a triglyceride. And a triglyceride just means three fatty acid, one, two, three, hooked to uh, glycerol. And this is a triglyceride. Tri means three. And uh, like I said, it's the most common fat in your body. I guess I should say that this triglyceride is considered unsaturated because it has one double carbon bond in the triglyceride. You only need one and you're considered unsaturated. So even though that's totally saturated, that's totally saturated, we say this triglyceride is unsaturated. 
and a triglyceride contains three fatty acids linked together with glycerol. Triglycerides are the richest energy source stored as adipose in animals. If you uh, need a lot of energy and you have to carry it and you're trying to figure out what molecule of food should I carry to give myself the most energy, you would want to bring or carry a bunch of triglycerides, meaning fat, because you get the most energy per gram out of one gram of fat or lipid than one gram of any other food you can eat. So it's the body's richest energy source. And let's say you're in Point, Point Barrow, Alaska, driving around in the winter time, and you don't have a coat on because you're using the uh, heater in your car and your car breaks down and you're got to hike into the city or the town and it's 20 miles away or further and you got to walk that way and you're you're wondering what can I carry to to give myself energy to get to the town and like I said the best thing to do would be to uh, carry something that is a fat or a, um, a lipid because you'll get the most energy out of it. All right, moving on to our different types of lipids. We have a phospholipid and it's a very unusual lipid. A phospholipid is a lipid that is two fatty acids right here and right there bound to a glycerol right here. But in the third position, we don't have a fatty acid because that would be a triglyceride. We have a phosphate molecule, and this we call a, a phospholipid. You should note that phospholipids are unusual among lipids because they have a polar region. The phosphate group is polar. The uh, glycerol is slightly polar, although it's not much polar, but it is slightly polar. And then a nonpolar region, the, uh, the uh, fatty acids are nonpolar. Any question about any of that? That makes phospholipids unusual for a lipid because they are biphasic. They can dissolve in both water and in oil or lipids. So a nonpolar molecule can only dissolve in oil or lipids. It will not dissolve in water. And then a polar molecule or ionic can dissolve in water but would not dissolve in lipids. Phospholipids can dissolve in both because it is a biphasic molecule. When you have a bunch of phospholipids together, they will start forming this structure in water, and I'll talk about that a little longer and a little bit in the next slide. The phospholipids are the main part of the cell membrane of eukaryote cells, and bacteria. Oop, I'm a little bit beyond that. Uh, let me end here. Are there any questions? All right, if there's no questions, I'll end it here. And I will see you at 7 for the lab, for those of you who are coming to the 7 p.m. lab. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.